Thank you very much indeed, Samira, and thank you all for, for coming along. Really, Samira's opening remarks set the theme for today. She referred to Huxley, Darwin's bulldog, and of course that debate with Wilberforce in 1860 was when the theory of evolution entered the mainstream. It's when science met wider public opinion. And that's really what this event is all about, and it's what the British Science Association stands for. The British Science Association was, was founded back in 1831 on the basic proposition that science was so important it could not just be left to scientists. It had to provide an environment where scientists met and engaged with lay people such as myself, and that's what we've been trying to do ever since. And that's why today we want to talk about the, the crucial moment often when a science faces the wider public, and that is when it's applied, when it becomes a technology, when it starts expecting people to use it, when it starts being applied. And that moment when science enters the mainstream is when it interacts with human beings in all our complexity. And sometimes we react in ways that the scientists and the technologists do not expect or understand. And trying to understand that process today is really what the conference is about. We're delighted to have such a fantastic array of speakers and advisors, but we want everybody to contribute. We're particularly grateful to our sponsors, EY, Diageo, SCI, the London Chamber of Commerce, and of course the Royal Institution for helping us host this event in this historic location where Faraday gave his Christmas lectures and of course they thrive to this day. Just very briefly, I hope, let me identify three issues that I hope we might cover in the course of our conference today. First of all, is it just a matter of getting the facts straight? Is it just a matter of correcting a deficit of understanding in the wider public, or is it more complicated than that? I mean, sometimes it is just the facts. I still remember going to a science festival where the BBSRC had brilliantly assembled a set of tomato plants or pea plants or something. And they asked the, the kids, the youngsters coming through the science festival, which one of those plants was GM. And of course, some of them were perfectly flourishing, healthy plants, and there were some manky, misshapen plants and weedy plants. And over 90% of the kids took the most misshapen plant and said that was GM. So it told us something about how an attempt to explain GM had failed. But it's rarely just a matter of correcting a deficit in understanding. I think of a very different event, a meeting that I had with German MPs after we had voted in the House of Commons to allow the uh, dis replacement donation of mitochondrial DNA for, for when an embryo had been identified that had mitochondrial disease. And they were explaining to us why it would be impossible for them to do that in Germany because of the associations with Nazism and the belief that humans had to be improved and there were perfect human beings and all sorts of cruelty and abomination was justified in the pursuit of the perfection of human beings and this would be seen as, a go, as going back to the days of Nazism. And who was I to disagree with them when they were making that kind of value judgment? So how much of this is facts and how much is a wider requirement on scientists to understand values and doubts that people have? When the Science Wise did uh, structured dialogues around new scientific propositions that we knew were on their way to becoming technologies when I was the minister, one of the themes in the feedback all the time was lay people saying, why are the scientists doing this? Are they just doing it for the glory? Are they just doing it for the prestige? What are the motivations? Those are all legitimate questions. So this isn't just a matter of plugging a deficit of understanding, though that is part of the story. I would say, secondly, there's a particular problem emerging from the structure of our education system because we specialise so early that you have scientists who have, since the age of 16, been doing sciences and sadly not been doing a range of other disciplines as well. And then you have others who stopped doing any science or maths at the age of 16. That makes 
communication more difficult, and it makes it harder to bring together insights from a range of different disciplines. So are there other disciplines that in the journey of a science to application really need to be drawn on? And we can see this. Driverless cars, we need experts in jurisprudence to work out questions of responsibility, including legal responsibility. Is it the person writing the software that told the driverless car that if you've got one, pa one pedestrian in front of you and a ravine to your side where 30 passengers are going to be killed, you, should, you, have to run over the pass you have to run over the pedestrian. Is that person legally responsible when the coach takes that decision? Is it different when you do that as a plan, writing a code, writing algorithms in cold blood rather than the instinctive reaction of a driver? These are questions that go way beyond classic sciences into morals, into ethics and law. So drawing on the insights for a wider range of disciplines and how can we do that better is a second issue. And then thirdly, the need for a range of diverse voices. Uh, we, in, in government, as I know to my cost, government and politicians are not automatically trusted nowadays. I have to say business is not automatically trusted. <laughs> when I look at the GM experience, one of the lessons from that was the business model that drove GM, which involved, of course, the GM seeds being sterile so that the farmer had to go and buy another set for the following year, was for many people in a very unattractive or even repellent way of funding and innovation in agriculture. And they weren't going to buy the arguments for the business community. But independent bodies like the Plant Breeding Institute, which had been around for decades, had been privatised. So there weren't enough voices of experts on GM who were not either government or business to help explain what was going on and listen and absorb reactions. So institutional diversity. And so I hope in the course of today with all these fantastic speakers, if we can touch on those types of issues. Is it just a matter of explaining the facts? And if not, how do you have a proper dialogue with lay people? How do you bring in the expertise and the frameworks and of a different range of disciplines, and how do you ensure there are different voices often embodied in a diverse range of institutions? Those are the type of challenges we will face. If we're to succeed in harnessing scientific advance as technological advance, but not betraying the principles on which our society rests. Thank you all very much indeed.